Welcome to Present Perfect. No grammar, but plenty of history. I'm Don Congdon, your host and guide, helping you explore how the past reaches out and touches the present. This is podcast number 221 of the series entitled Inflection Point, the Church of the First Century. We've reached an important milestone today, the end of the very early church's first decade, which began in A.D. 32 and ended in A.D. 39. It's taken us eight podcasts to cover that eight-year period. I'm sure some of you wondered if we'd ever get out of the decade. Well, we're here at last. Today we're going to wrap it up, do a quick summary, and then get ready to move on to the second decade. Let's begin with the final two events that Luke documents near the end of Acts chapter 9. As you recall, Saul has just left Jerusalem and returned to his home city of Tarsus. The intense persecution that he had orchestrated about four years earlier has subsided. Apparently, no one else stepped in to fill that vacuum, so the very early church enjoyed a period of quiet. Recall that Saul's efforts had scattered the Jerusalem congregation throughout Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. We know that it also had a presence in Damascus. The apostles remained based in Jerusalem and led the very early church from there. As Acts chapter 9 verses 32 through 35 tells us, however, they did travel. Now, as Peter was traveling through all those regions, he also came down to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas who had been bedridden for eight years because he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your own bed. Immediately he got up, and all who lived at Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. We don't know why Peter visited Lydda, a city about 25 miles northwest of Jerusalem. It was an old city, called Lod in Old Testament times, and still called that today. Perhaps he was visiting a local group of believers. Or perhaps the Lord had sent him specifically to that city as an outreach. We also don't know anything about Aeneas. It's worth noting that he had a Greek name, which would suggest that he came from a Hellenized Jewish family. But beyond that, we know nothing else. The miracle Peter performed is reminiscent of the one that he and John had performed shortly after Pentecost near the temple. It's also reminiscent of several of Jesus' miracles. And it had much the same effect. It caught the attention of those in Lydda itself as well as those in the surrounding region of Sharon. As the passage tells us, many people turn to the Lord through this single miracle. Remember, signs are for the Jewish people, and they can be both powerful and convincing. But another, much more unusual miracle was about to supersede this one, bringing a dead person back to life. Now, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which when translated means Dorcas. This woman was excelling in acts of kindness and charity, which she did habitually. But it happened at that time that she became sick and died. And when they had washed her body, they laid it in an upstairs room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Do not delay in coming to us. The seaside city of Joppa, modern Jaffa, was about 15 miles from Lydda. Clearly, it already had a local congregation of believers. Apparently, word of Peter's miracle in Lydda had reached it. In all events, Peter returned with the men and reached Joppa before Tabitha's burial. Incidentally, Tabitha is an Aramaic name and Dorcas is its Greek equivalent. Note also that we don't know what the Joppa congregation expected of Peter. I doubt they expected him to resurrect her, so perhaps they just wished him to be at her burial. When he arrived, they brought him into the room upstairs, and all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. But Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. 
and he gave her his hand and raised her up, and calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. Resurrection is an extremely rare miracle, mentioned only ten times in the entire Bible. Elijah and Elisha account for three of these in Old Testament times. Jesus raised three people during his ministry, and Peter and Paul each raised one person. Of course, we shouldn't forget Jesus' own resurrection. And finally, there's the rather odd incident that Matthew mentions in which Old Testament saints resurrected at Jesus' death. Not only is resurrection rare, it's also extremely compelling because it's nearly impossible to fake. It carries a powerful message and is of unquestionable origin since only God can restore life. Remember the religious leader's reaction to Lazarus' resurrection. In this case, it's quite clear that the miracle had a significant effect outside the Joppa congregation. It became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. While I'm sure God gave the miracle as a gift to the local believers, I think its main purpose was wider, a dramatic outreach to the undecided Jewish people in the surrounding area. Remember, signs are for the Jewish people. With this compelling miracle, the very early church's rather packed first decade ended. Back in podcast number 212, I listed seven questions that I was going to ask and answer for each decade. If you remembered my list, I'm sure you've probably answered some of them yourself. But if you haven't, or if I didn't answer them clearly, I'm going to go through them now. Here goes. Question 1. What was going on with Israel and what was going on with the Gentiles? I'll answer this one in reverse. Nothing was happening with the Gentiles. No pure Gentiles were part of the very early church yet. Some Gentile proselytes to Judaism and many Samaritans had become believers. The Gentiles did, however, have their own apostle, Saul of Tarsus, but his ministry in this capacity hadn't fully emerged. Things will change in the second decade, so keep an eye on the Gentiles. Israel was really the focus of the first decade. In other words, it was standing at its inflection point, trying to decide which way to go. Thousands had believed, including some of the religious leadership. But the nation as a whole hadn't turned to Jesus as its Messiah. On the contrary, Israel's core leadership was actively trying to suppress what it saw as a dangerous branch of Judaism. Although the church had officially begun in A.D. 32, the transition period really hadn't started yet. We're still firmly in the inflection period. Perhaps God resurrected Tabitha as an exclamation point in his message to Israel, since, as we'll see, the road is about to fork. Questions 2 and 3. What issues, problems, or challenges did the church face, and how did it address them? Which doctrines did God reveal, and how did he reveal them? Let's answer these together. The very early church had to deal with three main issues during its first decade. One of the most challenging was its rapidly expanding numbers. While it started out as a tightly knit communal group, it quickly outgrew this stage. Its leadership had to expand to accommodate day-to-day issues such as fairness and practical matters like food distribution. After Saul's persecution scattered the Jerusalem congregation, its leadership had to manage congregations that were geographically distant. As we know from Saul's history, some local congregations were more than 100 miles from Jerusalem by the end of the decade. While these distances are insignificant today, In the ancient world, they were anything but trivial. Managing many small and distant congregations undoubtedly proved challenging, but also foreshadowed what God ultimately intended to be the church's final form. Many local congregations no longer associated with any kind of central leadership. The second major challenge was establishing doctrine and authority. Aside from the existing Old Testament scriptures, however, the very early church had no written guidance. Instead, it had an oral tradition based on Jesus' teachings. Remember, at Pentecost there were 120 disciples gathered, 
We also know from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6, that Jesus had appeared to more than 500 people before he ascended to the Father. These were Jesus' larger group of disciples who had followed him and heard his teachings. But many of Jesus' teachings during his time on earth focused on reaching out to Israel and offering it the kingdom. Contrary to what Reformed theology teaches, relatively little of Jesus' instruction during his ministry had to do with the church. We don't know how much instruction Jesus gave during the 40 days after his resurrection. As I mentioned in an earlier podcast, he did reach out to his half-brother James, which altered that man's life enormously. And Acts chapter 1 verse 3 tells us that he met with the apostles— speaking of things regarding the kingdom of God. But whether these were periods of concentrated instruction or not is unknown, since the New Testament doesn't elaborate. At any rate, at least we know the subject, the millennial kingdom and the events surrounding it. Very early church doctrine therefore came mostly through the apostles. Recall that the leadership crisis documented in Acts chapter 6 came about because the apostles were getting diverted from their primary duties, prayer and teaching, to dealing with everyday matters. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Instead, brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. From this passage, we can conclude that new doctrine was indeed coming to the apostles and that they were passing it along orally. We also know that God had strongly emphasized the concept of apostolic authority. The Ananias and Sapphira incident demonstrates this. It also fits with the notion that the apostles were the only source of new revelation. God had to make it unambiguously clear that he was speaking through the apostles. As we'll discover in future decades, however, God did provide other sources of revelation along with the means to test them for authenticity. Most of these sources were purely temporary phenomena, however. And we must never forget that the final source of true doctrine, the one that we rely solely on today and call the New Testament, came through the apostles and their closest associates. The third major challenge that the very early church faced was accepting the fact that God was reaching out to the whole world, not just Israel, through the church. Although Jesus emphasized a worldwide outreach before he ascended, this didn't happen immediately. Not until God allowed persecution did the very early church leave the Jerusalem area and start reaching out to the surrounding regions, eventually reaching Samaria. Interestingly, although the Jewish people and the Samaritans mutually despised each other, there doesn't seem to have been much difficulty in accepting the Samaritan believers. More friction seems to have come through the Hellenized Jewish believers who probably felt a bit too Gentile to the Jewish believers who had rejected the Greek culture. As we'll see in the next decade, the Samaritan and Hellenized Jewish believers were a good warm-up for what was to come, completely Gentile believers. These will most certainly challenge the very early church leadership with a major crisis of understanding. More to come on that. Question 4. Who were the key figures or groups? The apostles were the key figures during this decade. They were the primary teachers and the source of new revelation. They supervised the church, and their word on doctrinal matters was final. We also know that the Jerusalem leadership included men like Jesus' half-brother James, who seems to have had a role close to that of an apostle. His name comes up as an authority figure on several occasions during the very early church's first few decades. He also authored the very first New Testament book. The Jerusalem congregation itself was the nucleus and heart of the very early church, with the scattered congregations closely tied to it. 
At the same time, other levels of leadership were emerging since the church was getting far too large for the apostles to manage. The office of deacon emerged as a solution to this problem. As we'll see later, however, the office changed significantly and became the form that the church is supposed to be following today. Question 5. What changed during this decade relative to the one before it? Obviously, we can't answer this one since this is the first decade. Question 6. Which books of the New Testament were written during this decade? That's easy. None. Question 7. What else was happening in the world? It was a busy time for the Mediterranean world. Rome had transitioned from a republic to an empire just 111 years before. Caligula, its third emperor, was ruling. The empire was expanding and establishing many of the qualities that we still associate with the Roman Empire today. As far as Palestine was concerned, Judea had been a Roman province for only 33 years. Galilee was still under the Herod family. I'm planning to devote the next podcast to Rome and a future podcast to the Herods. I'm sure you'll find them interesting and useful for understanding the first century. The Jewish people were deeply divided on the subject of Rome. Some, like the core leadership, enjoyed their favored status and relationship with Rome. They didn't want any changes and certainly no dangerous insurrections. On the other hand, zealot groups were decidedly unhappy with the political situation and were laying plans for violent change. And on that tantalizing note, we'll stop. So until next time, I'm Don Congdon and this is Present Perfect. Have a great day. Present Perfect is a copyright of Don Congdon. Music is copyright footage firm incorporated. Scripture quotations are from the New American Standard Bible, which is a copyright of the Lachman Foundation. This podcast is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Just search for Present Perfect Church History.